Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, Korea and Canada conclude their negotiations for a bilateral free trade agreement. Officials say the pact could come into effect within a year. South Korea's top military officer tells his American counterpart that Seoul is open to closer security ties with Japan to counter threats posed by North Korea. Plus, the search for the missing Malaysia Airlines jetliner is now focused on the Malacca Strait after military radar suggests the plane turned west, away from its planned route, before disappearing. Daybreak begins now. Thanks ever so much for joining us. To all our viewers here in Korea and around the world, it's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, March 12th here in Seoul. You're watching Daybreak, and I'm Mark Broom. Now, we start with some very good news on a long-stalled bilateral free trade deal. Following their second summit talks in just six months, President Park Geun-hye and visiting Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper have wrapped up talks on an FTA between the two countries. Our presidential correspondent Choi Yoo-sun starts us off. Korea's comprehensive trade pact with its 25th trading partner goes beyond goods and services to include investments, finance and intellectual property. 이번 FTA 협상 타결은 양국 간의 통상과 투자를 포함해서 호혜적인 협력을 더욱 확대하기 위한 제도적 기반을 마련할 것이라는 점에서 매우 의의가 크다고 생각합니다. It will create jobs and opportunities for Canadians today and just as importantly for the generations that follow. Over the next 10 years, each side will lift tariffs on nearly 98 percent of goods. For Korean automakers whose products make up almost half of the nation's 10 billion U.S. dollar annual exports to Canada, the 6 percent tariff barrier will be removed in two years. This means Korean companies like Hyundai and Kia, which currently make up 12 percent of the Canadian market, will be able to make further inroads in the North American country. While more than 200 farm products, including rice, are exempt from the deal, relatively high tariffs of up to 40 percent on Korean beef and pork will be partially lifted over the next 5 to 15 years. To allay concerns among Korean livestock farmers worried about the impact of trade deals with both Canada and Australia, Seoul says it's working on measures to assist them. Canada is now Korea's 12th FTA partner. After the deal is signed and approved by the parliaments of each country, it is expected to go into effect next year. Stressing that bilateral security cooperation is as important as economic issues, Prime Minister Harper expressed support for President Park's trust-building policies towards North Korea. The two leaders then urged Pyongyang to completely and verifiably rid itself of all its nuclear arms. Choi yoo sun Arirang News. And while we're speaking of FTAs, Korea is also making headway on another free trade pact, this one with Vietnam. A fourth round of free trade talks between Korea and Vietnam kicks off on this Wednesday in Ho Chi Minh City. The two sides are expected to hold discussions on various areas, including products, services and investment. The talks are scheduled to run through this Friday. Negotiations for the bilateral FTA were launched in September 2012. Vietnam is Korea's second largest trading partner among ASEAN nations. The vice foreign ministers of Korea and Japan will hold rare talks in Seoul on this Wednesday on a range of security and bilateral issues. But, as our Hwang Sang-hee tells us, no one is holding out much hope for any significant warming of the two countries' frosty ties. Amid souring ties between South Korea and Japan, Japanese Vice Foreign Minister Akitaka Saiki will arrive in Seoul Wednesday for talks with his South Korean counterpart Cho Tae-yong. Wednesday's talks will be the first vice ministerial-level meeting between the two neighboring countries in eight months. But Seoul's foreign ministry says it's not a sign of thawing ties. The South Korean government repeated several times what steps Japan must take for progress in Korea-Japan ties. 
Japan has yet to officially apologize for its wartime sexual enslavement of roughly 200,000 women in the early 20th century. In an interview with Japan's Mainichi Shimbun Tuesday, Chinese ambassador to Japan Chang Yonghua called out Tokyo for its lack of responsibility over historical issues, speaking about why the annual trilateral summit between South Korea, China and Japan did not take place last year. The Chinese diplomat blamed Japan and said he does not see such a meeting happening in the near future. But U.S. President Barack Obama will try to mediate when he visits Seoul and Tokyo for summit talks in April. Washington wants its two allies to put history behind them, concerned the intensifying friction will affect their trilateral alliance. Ahead of President Obama's trip, the three leaders will meet at the end of this month in The Hague for the nuclear security summit. Some point to the possibility of a trilateral summit, but the chances of the two neighbors shaking hands are slim. South Korean President Park Geun-hye has made it perfectly clear that she will not sit down with a leader who fails to acknowledge his country's historical wrongdoings. Hwang Chang-hee, Arirang News. So as we can see there, Seoul and Tokyo's relationship has soured over recent months and years due to a range of historical and territorial issues. But South Korea's top military officer has stressed the importance of cooperating with Japan on security issues in the face of continued threats by North Korea. Speaking to reporters in Washington Tuesday, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Che yun hee said South Korea, the US and Japan must form a tight trilateral partnership to deal with the constant and unpredictable threats posed by the North Korean regime. He added that the South Korean military remains on firm combat readiness despite Pyongyang's recent peace offensive. Che is on a week-long trip to the U.S. on the invitation of his American counterpart, General Martin Dempsey, for talks on security issues facing the Korean Peninsula. A North Korea-flagged tanker laden with crude from a rebel-controlled port in Libya has escaped its naval escort and is headed for international waters. A member of Libya's General National Congress said Tuesday that the tanker took advantage of poor weather conditions to head for the open sea and the ships that were surrounding it were not in a position to follow it. The Libyan government had said Monday that they had stopped the tanker as it tried to leave the Al Sidra terminal, but a spokesman for the rebels at that time had, existed, had insisted rather the ship was still under their control. The 37,000 ton tanker named Morning Glory is believed to have taken on over 30 million US dollars worth of crude sold without the government's permission. And uh, Libya's parliament, furious with the ship's apparent escape, has dismissed Prime Minister Ali Zidane. Defence Minister Abdallah Al Thini has been named interim Prime Minister. Back here in South Korea, and the country's scandal ridden spy agency is under fire once again. Prosecutors raided the headquarters of the National Intelligence Service through the early hours of Tuesday over suspicions it fabricated evidence in an espionage case. Julianne reports. The nation's spy agency is staring down the barrel of another scandal. Prosecutors on Tuesday are digging into documents seized during a seven-hour raid of the National Intelligence Service overnight. The NIS, already a target of public criticism for meddling in the 2012 presidential election, is suspected of tampering with documents to support its charge that a whole city government official is a North Korean spy. The suspicions have gained traction in recent days. After an NIS informant claimed he had yet to receive money, he was promised for faking the documents. The prosecution's raid came hours after President Park Geun-hye ordered a thorough investigation into the case. This is the second time the prosecution has raided the spy agency since President Park came into office more than a year ago. In April last year, prosecutors looked into allegations that the National Intelligence Service's former chief ordering agents to drum up support online for then-candidate Park in the 2012 election. Late last year, the National Assembly passed a bill requiring an overhaul of the spy agency and banning it from participating in domestic politics. The back-to-back -back scandals are fueling the public's distrust of the NIS, with opposition politicians calling for the resignation of NIS chief Nam Jae-jun. 
Depending on the investigation outcome, NIS agents involved in the scandal could be charged with breaching the national security law for the first time ever in history. Yurian, Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Four days later and the hunt continues for missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Malaysia's military now believes the plane had not only turned around but had in fact flew hundreds of kilometres off course after its last contact with air traffic control. Police say they're looking into whether any passengers or crew on the plane had personal or psychological problems that might explain its disappearance. Pauli reports. The Malaysian military has reportedly tracked the missing jetliner by radar over the Malacca Strait. The location is quite far from where the passenger plane last made radio contact with air traffic controllers off the country's east coast. The Boeing 777 apparently vanished one hour after taking off from Kuala Lumpur for Beijing on Saturday. Since then, there has been no confirmed trace of the aircraft or the 239 people on board. A military official close to the investigation told Reuters that the plane had suddenly changed course, taking a lower altitude, and then made its way to the Malacca Strait. The disappearance is being considered one of the most unprecedented cases in recent aviation history. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 had made no distress signal or indicated that there was any problem, leaving investigators to search through the passenger list and crew manifest for clues. Interpol Secretary General Ronald Noble said Tuesday that the two passengers who used stolen Austrian and Italian passports to board the missing plane had been identified. Noble said the two young men entered Malaysia using valid Iranian passports. He said 18-year-old Poria Nur Mohammadi and 29-year-old Delavar Saeed Mohammed Raza were likely trying to migrate to Germany. Interpol said it was unlikely that they were part of a terrorist group. Meanwhile, Malaysian police earlier said they had not ruled out the possibility of hijacking, sabotage or mechanical failure. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Three years have passed since the meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan and the effects of the disaster are still being felt to this day. To mark the third anniversary on Tuesday, a group of lawmakers in Korea held an event in Parliament to call on the government to reduce the country's dependence on nuclear power. Our National Assembly correspondent, Ji Myung Gil, reports. Lawmakers at the National Assembly urged the government to reduce the country's reliance on nuclear power as its main source of electricity at an event Tuesday held in remembrance of the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. The lawmakers advised the public not to forget the lessons of the incident in Japan and to consider the implications for Korea. One lawmaker reported on her three-day visit to radiation-exposed sites around Fukushima. After three years, most of the contaminated areas stand in neglect and people are still suffering. The Japanese government says the Fukushima disaster is mostly under control. There is a big problem with remarks like that and the Korean government's plans to build more nuclear power plants. Han Myung-suk, who leads the Parliamentary Sustainable Development Committee, lashed out at the Japanese government for restarting the country's nuclear reactors. The Japanese people and especially children are still suffering three years after the crisis. The Abe administration has broken its promise of denuclearization, and I believe the government is out of its mind to restart the nuclear power plants. Abe is sure to be disregarded by his people. Meanwhile, the government is trying to use more renewable energy resources. The National Assembly has its own solar panels, which generate roughly 165 kilowatts of electricity per year. The panels are capable of reducing carbon dioxide levels by some 87 tons per year. 
Last year, the National Assembly passed a bill requiring that 10 percent of the electricity in all new buildings in Seoul that are more than 100 square meters come from renewable energy resources. The bill also requires that more than 50 percent of the lights in the buildings have LED bulbs. Kim young Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye says she wants to help Korea become a hub for the development of new growth engines and shake its image as a follower of others. Now, now Hyung Young reports on how the ministry in charge of the president's drive has announced specific plans to achieve this goal. The ICT and Future Planning Ministry has unveiled a detailed roadmap for how the government intends to realize a creative economy this year. At a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, the ministry said a significant amount of this year's 2.5 trillion won or roughly 2.3 billion U.S. dollar budget will go toward producing more visible results. On top of a 100 billion won or 94 million dollar fund created last year to give venture startups a leg up, the government will invest additional 94 million dollars this year. And another $94 million, a five-fold increase from 2013, will be injected into a project dubbed the Creative Vitamin Project, aimed at meshing science and technology with existing sectors. This is in line with a major goal that the President Park Geun-hye administration has been pushing ever since coming into office in February last year, developing new and creative growth engines for the country. The ministry plans to focus on making private entities take the lead and launching initiatives toward realizing a creative economy this year. It also plans on expanding this initiative from the central to local governments and helping more young entrepreneurs develop their innovative ideas so they can break into the global market. However, with some media reports pointing out that the ministry spent only 3 percent of its total budget in January, critics are voicing concerns that the money allocated for building a creative economy could go to waste if the government does not set up clearer guidelines for how the money is to be spent. Na hyun Arirang News. Now, unfortunately, it's happened again. A total of 12 million Koreans have had their personal information leaked. The Busan Metropolitan Police Agency said Tuesday that it has booked 17 people without detention for collecting, analyzing and selling personal data, which includes phone numbers, addresses and bank account numbers. The police said the criminals hacked into the computers of a telecommunication retail store to obtain the information. Good day, I'm Eunice Kim, and here are your headlines from around the world. We'll begin with the latest developments on the Ukraine crisis as its interim leaders move to establish a new defense force on Tuesday and appeal to Western nations for aid. Acting President Oleksandr Turchinov said the National Guard would be sourced from veterans as the country is set to only have 6,000 combat-ready men. Its air force is said to be outnumbered 10 to 1 by Russia's fleet. Meanwhile, the EU agreed a package of trade breaks to Ukraine worth about 700 million U.S. dollars. This as the French foreign ministry said it could impose a series of sanctions against Russia as early as this week. That would include asset freezes and travel bans. And from Russia, ousted President Viktor Yanukovych declared that he remains Ukraine's legitimate president and commander of its armed forces. Acting President Turchinov countered by saying that Yanukovych left the military and such a poor state that it had to be built effectively from scratch. Over to Washington now, where the head of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee has accused the CIA of spying on Congress. Chairwoman Dianne Feinstein expressed her grave concerns accusing the CIA of searching committee computers to probe how its staff accessed an internal agency review, thereby possibly violating the principle of separation of powers outlined in the U.S. Constitution. CIA Director John Brennan has denied the charges, and the clash does come as the Senate Intelligence Committee is examining the spy agency's interrogation and detention program that began after 9-11 during the Bush administration. 
Mad cow disease has reared its head for the first time in a decade in Greece. The country's local daily, Katimerini, reports two cows with BSE were found dead in a farm in central Greece. Authorities have since quarantined that farm. The pair of dead cows were imported from the Netherlands. And Paris topped the list of the world's most popular tourism destinations. This according to the Ile de France Regional Tourism Committee, which cited hotel occupancies. The tourism body found that the City of Lights attracted more than 32 million people last year, recording the highest level of foreign visitors in 10 years. The most number of people came across the channel from Britain, followed by Americans, Germans, Italians and Chinese. Visitors from the Middle East also recorded an over 20 percent increase, while the number of French tourists to Paris dropped by 7.5 percent. Now, it's been weeks since the Sochi Winter Games came to a close and weeks since Kim Yeon-ha retired from figure skating. But despite all that, the Korean Olympic Committee continues to fight with the IOC and the International Skating Union over the controversial second place finish. And with that, the situation has been brought up to the head of the ISU, asking them if everything that needed to be reviewed was reviewed, challenging the judges scoring during the free skating performance. The Korean Olympic Committee also added that they plan to have experts review the performances by Kim yeon and Adelina Sotnikova and even make legal investigations if required. And over to curling this time as the South Korean curling team got some good news on Tuesday as Ujung Bushi looking to build, is looking to build the nation's first official curling rink. The Gyeonggi-do province and Ujung Bushi will be looking to build the nation's first official curling rink in hopes that the Olympic team prepare for the Pyeongchang Winter Games in 2018 and the growth of the sport here in the nation as well. While there are two ice rinks here in the nation currently being used as curling rinks, none of them are regulation-sized curling rinks. And of course, with the recent success of the South Korean women's curling team, the sport continues to get support. And shifting over to the AFC Champions League group stages where the Puang Steelers were able to pull away with a 2-1 win over Buriam United of Thailand thanks to two first-half goals from Kim tae Su and Kim seung dae Meanwhile, FC Seoul drew 1-1 against Beijing Guan thanks to an equalizer from Ko Yohan in the 72nd minute of the match. And with that, over to some Tuesday night's V-League action. The Korean Expressway beat Hungkook Insurance Live Pink Spiders 3 sets to 2 as the Korean Air Jumbos took on LIG. So let's take a look at the highlights. Now the Korean Air Jumbos looking for their second straight win look great against the LIG greatest, combining both the offense and the defense in this game. LIG on a way to, uh, unable to win a single set here as Michael Sanchez of Korean Air Jumbos put up 30 points on the night as the Korean Air Jumbos take this match 3 sets to nothing. And finishing things off in tennis, where two defending champions at Indian Wells made an early exit as Maria Sharapova and Rafa Nadal both lost in the third round. First off, Maria Sharapova going up against Camilla Giorgi lost in three sets, 6-3, 4-6, 7-5, giving the Italian her first win against a top five player. Then it was Rafa Nadal who failed to advance to the next round as well as he lost in three sets against Alexander Dokbalov of Ukraine. 6-3, 3-6, 7-6-5 despite rallying back in the second set. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
We have a welcome rain today and right now the most parts of the country is waking up to clouds and these morning clouds will give way to rain by this afternoon and this round of rain will take some dryness out of the air. So it will rain from Jeju and southern coast at around noon and then gradually spread to other regions so don't forget to have an umbrella handy today. And this morning it's starting out much milder than what we've had last few days but because of PM rain today daily high should be slightly slightly lower than yesterday. So let's take a closer look at those numbers. The morning lows in Seoul, Daegu, Gwangju all starts out at 4 and afternoon highs will rise to 10, 15 and 13 respectively while Busan get up to 14. Now for other regions, it looks like down on Jeju and Daejeon will climb up to 16 and 12 respectively while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at 3. Now that's all for now and back to you Mark in the studio. Thank you, Gian. Those are the stories we're following at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about 30 minutes' time, and we'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.